This is Space Time Series 21, Episode 17, coming up on Space Time. One of the most massive black holes ever seen, and the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter completes aerobraking around the red planet. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered what might be the biggest supermassive black hole ever seen. The findings, reported in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, follows observations of 72 galaxies in some of the known universe's brightest and most massive galaxy clusters. The authors used data collected by NASA's Chandra X-ray Space Telescope on galaxies up to 3.5 billion light-years away. The observations show that these ultra-massive black holes, as they're now being unofficially called, are growing faster than the stars in their galaxies. Most, if not all, galaxies are thought to contain supermassive black holes at their centres. Stellar mass black holes can be up to maybe 100 or more times the mass of the Sun. They're created out of the core collapse death of massive stars or through the merger of super-dense neutron stars. However, astronomers are still debating the origins of supermassive and now I guess ultramassive black holes fit in that category as well. These monster gravity wells are millions to billions of times the mass of the Sun. The authors calculated the masses of the black holes detected in these galaxy clusters by analysing their radio waves and X-ray emissions. The results showed that the masses of ultramassive black holes are roughly 10 times greater than those originally projected, calculated using a different method, which assumes supermassive black holes grow in tandem with their host galaxies. Furthermore, almost half of the black holes in the sample are calculated to be at least 10 billion times more massive than the Sun. And it's this which puts them in a class of extreme ultramassive black holes. The current record holder for the biggest known black hole is estimated at between 17 and 18 billion solar masses. However, some studies are hitting at even bigger black holes lurking in the far-off reaches of the cosmos, including possible behemoths of over 40 billion solar masses. The authors speculate that these newly identified black holes may be larger because they formed earlier on, or because they formed in really ideal environments which allowed them to grow more rapidly over billions of years. Interestingly, the host galaxies of these monster central black holes are also likely to become their victims. You see, the greater the mass of the black hole, the greater its gravitational pull. And as they suck in stars, planets, gas clouds and anything else that gets too close, these hypermassive black holes will produce powerful jets blasting out at close to the speed of light and destroying anything in their path. The authors speculate that could mean that they'll destroy much of their host galaxies as well. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Since arriving at Mars in October 2016, the Joint European Space Agency in the Roscosmos ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter has been aerobraking its way into a tight circular orbit around the red planet by using the top of the Martian atmosphere to create drag and slow down. The spacecraft's been using its solar arrays as spoilers to steadily modify its initial highly elliptical 98,000 by 200 kilometre four-day orbit. ESA mission manager's first acquired experience with error braking, at least on a test basis, at the end of the Venus Express mission in 2014. But this is the first time they've used the technique to achieve a routine orbit around another planet. Mission managers say the spacecraft's now almost at the right orbit to begin observations, with only a few hundred kilometres to go. Once aero braking is complete, the team will command the spacecraft to go through a series of up to 10 orbit trimming manoeuvres, one every few days, firing its thrusters to adjust its trajectory to a final 2-hour, 400-kilometre high circular orbit, which is expected to be achieved by around mid-April. Meanwhile, the initial phase of science gathering in mid-March will be devoted to checking out the instruments and conducting preliminary observations for calibration and validation. The start of routine science observations should begin around April the 21st. The probe will have been reoriented by then, keeping its camera pointing downwards and its spectrometers pointing towards the sun, so as to observe the Martian atmosphere and begin the long-awaited science phase of the mission. The mission's main goal is to take a detailed inventory of the atmosphere, sniffing out gases like methane. 
Martian methane has been detected both by Earth-based observatories and by spacecraft in orbit around the red planet. And the methane being detected on Mars appears to be seasonal, becoming more pronounced during the Martian summer. The thing is, methane gets broken down quickly through chemical processes in the atmosphere, so there must be something happening on Mars which is continuously replenishing it. And although it can be produced by geological processes, the vast majority of methane generated here on Earth comes from biological processes, such as bovine flatulence. Now, no one's suggesting that there are cows on Mars, but the ongoing detection of methane, especially through warm seasons on the red planet, could be hinting at some sort of microbial biological activity. And that's where the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter comes in. Its mission is to try and pin down what's actually going on, using a suite of four scientific instruments making complementary measurements of the atmosphere, surface and subsurface. Its onboard camera will help identify surface features such as volcanoes, which could be related to trace gas sources. The spacecraft will also look for water ice hidden below the surface, which could influence the choice of landing sites for future missions. And it will act as a telecommunications relay satellite, transmitting data and instructions between other Mars spacecraft and rovers and mission managers back on Earth. A NASA-supplied radio relay payload will catch signals from the US rovers on the red planet surface and relay those to NASA's Deep Space Network. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. OK, time now to take a break from the show and hear a word from our sponsor, Grammarly. If you write anything on the web, you'll become a big fan of Grammarly's. Their intelligent program will save you time and time again. Built by linguists and language lovers, Grammarly's writing app finds and corrects hundreds of complex writing errors, so you don't have to. You can easily copy and paste any English text into Grammarly's online text editor, or just install Grammarly's free browser extension for Chrome, Safari and Firefox. Grammarly's algorithms flag potential issues in the text and suggests context-specific corrections for grammar, spelling and vocabulary. Grammarly explains the reason behind each correction, so you can make an informed decision about whether and how to correct an issue. Grammarly helps you write mistake-free on Gmail, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and nearly anywhere else you write on the web. And for space-time listeners, Grammarly's offering a free download of the Grammarly software. To download Grammarly today, go to getgrammarly.com forward slash spacetime. That's www.getgrammarly.com forward slash spacetime so they know you came from us. And we'll include the link in the show notes as well. And now, it's back to our show. Time now to turn our eyes to the skies and check out the celestial sphere for March on Skywatch. And Happy New Year! Well, it would be if this was ancient Mesopotamia or Rome. The early Roman calendar, which had just 10 months, designated March the 1st as the New Year. In fact, that 10-month year is still reflected today, with names such as September or Septum, Latin for 7, October or Octo meaning 8, November or Novem, 9, and December or Deci meaning 10. In fact, it wasn't really until the Gregorian calendar came around that January the 1st marked the start of a new year. But in the beginning, it was mostly Catholic countries which adopted it. Protestant nations only gradually moved across, with the British, for example, not adopting the reformed calendar until 1752. Prior to that date, the British Empire and its American colonies still celebrated New Year on the 25th of March. Of course, the highlight for the month is the March equinox, which this year takes place at 3.15 on the morning of Wednesday, March the 21st, Australian Eastern Daylight Time. That's a quarter past four in the afternoon on Tuesday, March 20th, Greenwich Mean Time, and 12.15 US Eastern Time. For our listeners in the Northern Hemisphere, it means the start of spring. See, vernal in Latin means spring. While for those of us south of the equator, it's the autumnal equinox, meaning a move into autumn. The day marks the point in Earth's orbit around the Sun when the planet's rotational axial tilt means the Sun will appear to rise and set exactly due east. It means almost equal hours of darkness and light. In fact, the very word equinox is derived from the Latin meaning aquus or equal and nox meaning night. Of course, this all comes about because Earth's rotational axis is tilted at an angle of about 23.4 degrees in relation to the ecliptic, the imaginary plane created by Earth's orbit around the Sun. And that axial tilt is pointed towards the same position in the sky, regardless of Earth's orbital position around the Sun. 
On any other day of the year, either the northern or southern hemisphere are tilted more towards the sun. But on the two equinoxes, around March the 21st and September the 23rd each year, the tilt of Earth's axis is directly perpendicular to the sun's rays. Importantly for astronomy, the March equinox, also known as the vernal equinox in the Northern Hemisphere, is the moment in time used to define the celestial coordinate system of right ascension and declination. In astronomy, the celestial coordinate system is the astronomical answer to latitude and longitudinal coordinates on the Earth's surface. Celestial coordinates are used to specify the positions of objects in three-dimensional space and the direction of objects on the celestial sphere, the imaginary globe surrounding the Earth. It lets scientists determine the exact position of celestial objects, such as satellites, planets, stars, galaxies, whatever. Right ascension, which uses the symbol alpha, is the angular distance measured eastwards along the celestial equator from the vernal equinox. On the celestial sphere, it's analogous to terrestrial longitude. Declination, which uses the symbol delta, measures the angle north or south of the celestial equator. So it's the celestial equivalent to terrestrial latitude. Marking the time of the vernal equinox and setting in the western evening skies this time of year is one of the oldest recognised constellations in the heavens, Taurus the Bull, which was first so named some 6,000 years ago. In Greek mythology, Zeus, the king of gods, lusted after King Agenor's daughter Europa, who was looking after a herd of cattle. Being a god and with godlike powers, Zeus transformed himself into a powerful white bull so that he could get closer to the beautiful Europa. Once transformed into the bull Taurus, Zeus convinced Europa to climb on his back, and he then carried her off to the island of Crete. Taurus's head is represented by a dominant V-shaped grouping of stars. The most noticeable of these is the bright, reddish-looking star Aldebaran. It's actually an orange giant some one and a half times the mass of the Sun, located some 65 light-years away. A light-year is a distance of approximately 10 trillion kilometres. The distance a photon travels in a year at 300,000 kilometres per second, the speed of light in a vacuum, and the ultimate speed limit of the universe. Aldebaran's the 14th brightest star in the night sky, and it's the closest bright star to the point of the vernal equinox. In ancient Arabic, Aldebaran's name means the follower, as it appears to follow the seven sisters of the Pleiades. It's also the first of four royal or guardian stars identified by the ancient Mesopotamians. Lying near Aldebaran is a V-shaped group of young newborn stars known as the Hades. This is the nearest open star cluster to Earth, located just 153 light-years away. An open cluster is a group of stars thought to have originally all been created at the same time in the same molecular gas and dust cloud. Between Aldebaran and the constellation Orion is the spectacular Betelgeuse, the ninth brightest star in the night sky. Interestingly, both the name Betelgeuse and its more common pronunciation of Betelgeuse are both tortured mispronunciations of its original Arabic name, Yad al jazer or Ibn al yazi meaning the hand of the big man, the big man being Orion the hunter. Betelgeuse is a massive semi-regular variable red supergiant getting very close to the end of its life. Even though it's some 640 light years away, Betelgeuse is still one of the largest and most luminous stars visible to the unaided eye, and clearly noticeable at the very edge of Orion. Betelgeuse is so big that if it were located where the Sun is at the centre of our solar system, its surface would extend almost out as far as Jupiter, engulfing the orbits of all the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars, as well as the main asteroid belt. In stellar terms, Betelgeuse is incredibly young, beginning its life only about 10 million years ago as a blue giant. Betelgeuse is between 10 and 20 times the mass of our Sun, and it's expected to explode as a core collapse or type 2 supernova pretty well any day now. Of course, in astronomical terms, that could mean tomorrow, but it could just as easily mean in a million years' time. When it does explode, Betelgeuse will temporarily outshine all the other stars in the galaxy, and it should be clearly visible in the day sky from Earth. The last star to be seen by humans to go supernova in our galaxy was Tycho's star back in 1572, and that was before the invention of the telescope. So as you can imagine, scientists are eagerly looking to see what happens with Betelgeuse. According to one Greek mythology story, Orion the Hunter became a good friend to the goddess Artemis. However, her brother Apollo didn't approve of the relationship, and so he tricked Artemis into testing her skill by shooting at a distant speck in the ocean. Sadly, Artemis didn't know that the speck she was actually shooting at was Orion, swimming to escape a giant scorpion created by the Earth goddess Gaia to try and kill him. When Artemis realised what she had done, she placed Orion's body into the sky as the stars we see in the heavens today. 
Orion is easily identified by the three bright stars in a row which form Orion's belt. Hanging south from the belt are the stars which make up the sword of Orion. But if you look closely, the fuzzy looking middle star isn't really a star at all, but rather it's a huge star forming region known as Messier 42 or M42, the great nebula in Orion. It's the nearest large star forming region to Earth, located about 1300 light years away. The Orion Nebula is a huge area over 24 light years across, containing as much mass as some 2000 suns. At the very northern edge of the Orion constellation right now is Sirius the Dog Star, which is located just 8.6 light years away. It's easily the brightest star in our night sky, and almost twice as bright as Canopus, the next brightest star. Sirius actually consists of two stars in a binary system consisting of a white main sequence spectral type A star, Sirius A, and a small white dwarf, Sirius B, which orbits between 8.2 and 31.5 astronomical units away from the primary star. An astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, about 150 million kilometres, or 8.3 light minutes. 5,000 years ago, Sirius was important to the ancient Egyptians, who used its rising to determine the time of the flooding of the Nile River in antiquity. More recently, it's been claimed that the Dogon people of Mali in West Africa have ancient stories describing the 50 orbital period of Sirius and its companion White Dwarf, which it's claimed predate the White Dwarf's discovery by modern astronomers. The Dogon also refer to a third star accompanying Sirius A and B. Astronomers are yet to find that star. However, the Dogon stories may not be correct. A report in the journal Current Anthropologies raised doubts about whether the stars referred to by the Dogon were in fact Sirius A and its white dwarf companion. Apparently, senior Dogons say the story actually refers to a different grouping of stars. Other researchers have also pointed out that the Dogon could have heard about the discovery of Sirius's companion and incorporated into their mythology in 1893 when a French expedition arrived in central West Africa to observe the April 16 total solar eclipse. During their stay, they discussed the discovery of the Sirius White Dwarf, which was big news in astronomical circles at the time. OK, if we turn to the north now, you'll see two bright stars, Pollux and Castor, which represent the northern constellation of Gemini, the twins. In Greek mythology, they were brothers who travelled with Jason aboard the Argo in search of the Golden Fleece. Pollux is an orange-hued evolved giant star, located about 34 light-years away, it has about twice the sun's mass and about nine times its radius. In 2006, an extrasolar planet or exoplanet designated Pollux b was discovered orbiting it. The planet is a gas giant, and it orbits its host star every 1.61 Earth years. The other star, Castor, is actually a system of six stars comprising three eclipsing binaries. The system is located some 51 light years away. Eclipsing binaries are pairs of stars orbiting each other in such a way that one star transits in front of the other as seen from Earth. Turning to the northeast is the star Regulus or Little King, the brightest star in the constellation Leo the Lion. In Greek mythology, Leo was killed by Hercules as the first of his twelve labours. Located some 79 light years away, Regulus is a multiple star system. The spectroscopic binary, Regulus A, consists of a blue-white main sequence star about four times the mass of the Sun and a companion which has not yet been directly observed, but which is probably a white dwarf. The spectroscopic binaries are pairs of stars which orbit each other so closely that when seen from Earth they can only be separated by their individual spectroscopic signatures. Located further away are Regulus B, C and D, which are all dim main sequence stars. Main sequence stars, as the name suggests, are stars on the main sequence, stars like our Sun, which are fusing hydrogen in their cores into helium, the process which makes stars shine. At the other end of Leo are the stars Theta and Lota Leonis, the loins of the lion. Theta Leonis is about 165 light years away. It's a very young spectral type A white star, about 2.5 times the mass of the Sun. With an age of just 550 million years, Theta Leonis' spectrum shows enhanced absorption lines for metals. In astronomers speak, a metal is any element other than hydrogen or helium. This increased metallicity appears around 12% higher than what's found in our own star, the Sun. It allows the star to radiate with some 141 times the luminosity of the Sun from its outer atmosphere at an effective temperature of 9,350 Kelvin, literally giving it its white-hot glow. 
Lodelionis is a spectral type F yellow dwarf star, a little bit hotter and more massive than the Sun. By the way, our Sun's classified as a G type yellow dwarf. Lodelionis is also a spectroscopic binary. Also in LEO, you'll find the famous LEO triplet, a group of three galaxies, Messier 65, Messier 66 and NGC 3628, all appearing relatively close together in the sky. Messier 65, also known as NGC 3623, is an intermediate spiral or possibly barred spiral galaxy located about 35 million light years away. M65's disk appears slightly warped, and a relatively recent burst of star formation is suggestive of some gravitational interaction with the two other galaxies in the Leo triplet about 800 million years ago. Nearby is Messier 66, or NGC 3627. It's another intermediate spiral galaxy, some 95,000 light years wide, and located about 36 million light years away. The gravitational interaction from its past encounter with its neighbouring galaxies in the triplet has resulted in an extremely high central mass concentration, that is a high molecular to atomic mass ratio, with a resolved non-rotating clump of neutral atomic hydrogen which was apparently removed from one of its spiral arms. The third member of the group, NGC 3628, is also known as the Hamburger Galaxy. It's another spiral galaxy and it contains a spectacular 300,000 light year long tidal trail of gas and stars. NGC 3628 is located 35 million light years away. Its most conspicuous feature is the broad and obscuring band of dust located along the outer edge of its spiral arms, effectively transecting the galaxy to the view from Earth. OK, let's turn to the east now, and the constellation Corvus the Crow. According to the ancients, Corvus was such a clever crow, he could talk to people. However, he was also stubborn, and after refusing to speak to the god Apollo, he was banished to the skies, together with Crater the Cup and Hydra the Snake. One of the brightest stars in Hydra is Alphard, the solitary one, so named because it appears to be all alone in the sky. Turning back to the western horizon, pretty well where we started earlier, is the star Achenar, at the southern tip of the constellation Eridanus, the river. Located 139 light years away, Achenar is the primary star in the binary system Alpha Aridini. Of the ten apparent brightest stars in the night sky, Alpha Aridini is both the hottest and bluest in colour. That's due to Achenar being a spectral type B blue star, with some seven times the mass and 3,000 times the brightness of the Sun. Interestingly, Achenar's extremely high rotational velocity gives it an incredibly oblate shape, making it one of the least spherical stars in the Milky Way. In fact, its equatorial diameter is some 56% greater than its polar diameter. The secondary star is smaller, a spectral type A white star, orbiting the primary at a distance of roughly 12 astronomical units. Now before we leave this part of Skywatch, it's worth reminding you that March the 14th, or 314 in American speak, marks the yearly celebration of the mathematical constant pi. More than just the number associated with circles, Pi has important applications in astrophysics, orbital mechanics and other fields of astronomy. The current record for reciting Pi from memory is to over 70,000 digits. Imagine sitting next to that person at a dinner party. As for me, 3.14159 is about as far as it goes. As well as Pi Day, March 14 is also the birthday of the great Herr Professor, Dr Albert Einstein. A man I'm sure in the same league is Jonathan Nally, editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, who joins us now for the rest of our tour of the March night skies. Well, we'll start with the Milky Way, which in the middle of the evening this time of year is stretching from the southeast right across the sky to the northwest. For us in the southern hemisphere, there are plenty of bright stars and constellations to see in the southern half of the sky, including that Milky Way. Uh, there's the Southern Cross, of course. It's lying on its left-hand side at the moment, down in the southeast, sort of about halfway up from the horizon. The famous two-pointer stars, which are really bright stars, are just below it, one of them being the even more famous Alpha Centauri, looking straight up and a little bit to the west. I mean, when I say straight up, I mean right overhead and then a little bit to the west, west being where the sun sets. You'll see the constellation Canis Major. You, know, you won't make it out, of course, if you don't already know what it is, but you won't miss its brightest star, and that's the star Sirius, which is the brightest star in the night sky. And 
we were just talking about the Dogon people and uh, how it's claimed they may have been aware that Sirius is a small companion white dwarf star. Yeah, I think I think there's plenty of evidence around, isn't there, that there, there were people from that part of the world had visited Europe and other places around the time that that star. Had exactly, been. exactly. Yeah. And and <laughs> yeah, yeah, more more nonsense that people have come up with. Oh, how could they possibly have known that? Guy got a doctorate out of it, so because he did it for his dissertation. So. Oh, good. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, the, yeah. So yeah, Sirius is um, a double star, like many many star systems are. Quite a lot of them, in fact, including that famous Alpha Centauri we just spoke about, which may actually be a triple because there's a smaller star called Proxima Centauri, which is actually the closest star to the solar system. Proxima, of course, meaning proximate, close. It's not 100% certain, I don't think yet, that Proxima is a definite gravitationally held part of the Alpha Centauri system because it's quite a bit further away than the the two main stars of Alpha Centauri. But anyway, it's in the neighbourhood and it is the closest star to us. So we were talking about Sirius, uh, the brightest star in the night sky, uh, sort of up directly overhead and a little, little bit to the west. Look a bit further northwest and you'll find the unmistakable constellation Orion the Hunter, dominated at either side by its bright stars Rigel and Betelgeuse. And right through the middle of the constellation is the Hunter's Belt, three stars running right through the middle, very close together in a straight line. You can't miss those. Lower down towards the western horizon, at least in the first half of the month after sunset, you'll see uh, what looks like a wedge of stars with a reddish coloured star at one corner. This is actually the head of the constellation Taurus, and that reddish star is called Aldebaran. Some people call it Aldi Baron. The eastern half of the sky... We Sounds like a German that, supermarket. Yeah, Aldi Baron, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. The eastern half of the sky is pretty bare during the evening hours of March, but later in the night, constellation Virgo will be up nice and high in this bare area. It still looks bare, Virgo. There's not a great deal going on, unless you're an amateur astronomer with a telescope. For them, Virgo is anything but bare because it's home to thousands and thousands and thousands of galaxies. And with a backyard telescope, you can see at least dozens, up to hundreds of galaxies, depending on how good your telescope is, uh, how experienced you are at, at spotting them and of course how dark or light polluted your skies might be. Now if you're up before dawn you'll find that the Milky Way has actually seemed to swap position because uh, we're looking at a different half of it now and whereas during the evening it was stretching from the southeast to the northwest now it'll be spanning the sky from the northeast to the southwest and bringing with it the central region of our galaxy and the impressive constellations of Sagittarius and Scorpius with all the great things you can see through there even with just a pair of binoculars. It's best seen from the southern hemisphere because it's uh, well it's just because the way our earth is tilted means that we're tilted the southern hemisphere is tilted towards the center of the galaxy which is why places like australia and south america and south africa are really great places to do a lot of fundamental astronomy work because even though dozens you know, hundreds of observatories in the, in the northern hemisphere are always done fantastic work there are some sort of things you want to see out there in space and there's there might be only sort of one example of them or one nearby example of them. so the nearest nearby example of the center of a galaxy is our galaxy and that's best seen from the southern hemisphere. So we've got a bit of an advantage there. Now to the planets during March. Mercury, the innermost planet, is essentially out of view during this month. It's incredibly low on the western horizon, so really don't expect to see it uh, during March. Venus, the next planet out from the sun, can be seen for a short while, very low on the western horizon after sunset, but it might be hard or impossible to spot if you have any trees or hills or buildings in the way. The other planets that we can see are sort of uh, very late night or early morning ones. The giant planet Jupiter will rise above the eastern horizon around about 11 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time, so sort that out for your own, uh, own time zone, about 11 p.m. at the beginning of March, but by around about 9.30 p.m. at the end of the month, so it's rising a little bit earlier and earlier each day. Mars is following Jupiter up over the eastern horizon about two hours later. It's a smaller reddish planet and followed an hour later again by Saturn, which is a brighter, yellowish sort of planet. Now if you're an early riser and you want to try and identify these three planets, Jupiter, Mars and Saturn, and you don't already know how to spot them, well if you're up early around about 5 a.m. on the 8th of March, specifically the 8th of March, take a look because the moon will be right next to Jupiter. Right? Um, it'll be very easy to spot. There'll be the moon. You can't, spot, can't miss the moon. And there'll be this bright star-looking thing very close to the moon. That's actually the planet Jupiter. Right? You won't miss it because it's, it's really, really bright. Two mornings later, on the 10th of March, around 5 o'clock again, have a look and the moon will be right next to Mars. This is because the moon is sort of slowly moving across the sky from night to night as it, as it trundles around Earth's orbit, or its orbit around the Earth, I should say. So on the 8th, it'll be right next to 
to or appear to be right next to Jupiter. A couple of mornings later, it'll be, appear to be right next to Mars. And then the following morning, the 11th, it'll appear to be right next to Saturn. Okay, so that's a really easy way to spot the planets because the moon and the planets all are found in roughly the same sort of arc across the sky. Uh, they'll be in different places along that arc at different times of the year, but they're all more or less in the same sort of line. And so the moon very often, uh, well, regularly, in fact, sort of goes past, if you like, the planets because the planets are much further in the, in the background and the moon's in the foreground. And this is called the ecliptic. This is called the ecliptic, yeah. None of the planets, uh, and, and certainly not the moon, are not, not exactly in the ecliptic, which is the plane of all the planets in the solar system, but they're near enough to it. It doesn't really make a lot of difference when you're out there just looking with the naked eye. That's Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio, and as part of Virgin Australia's in-flight entertainment. If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash spacetimewithstuartgary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 